Welcome to this episode of the Nothing Ventured Primer with me, Arish Shah. In these Primer episodes, we explore the insights and backgrounds of our guests to give you a bit of an idea of what they've been up to and how they got involved in the tech and venture ecosystem. Enjoy. This season of Nothing Ventured is sponsored by Odin. Odin helps angels, VCs, and founders to raise and deploy capital seamlessly. You can structure your SPVs and now run your funds, handle capital calls, portfolio management more smoothly and easily in one place. Founders use Odin to raise their entire round in a few clicks by simply sending investors a link and receiving investments immediately. Odin works with over 5,000 investors and over 150 emerging fund managers and angel syndicates globally. Head to joinodin.com to learn more. That's J-O-I-N-O-D-I-N.com. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Nothing Ventured Primer with me, Arish Shah. Today in the studio with me, I'm really, really excited to have Clara Armand de Lille. Clara is the founder of Third Eye Media, a strategic communications, media relations, marketing and branding consultancy for startups, scale-ups and VCs. She has consulted for clients such as Atomico Ventures, Wise, formerly TransferWise, football NFT platform So Rare, which she supported from a $4 million seed announcement to a $680 million super round with SoftBank. Prior to founding Third Eye Media, Clara worked across startups like fintech iZettle uh, and funds like Accel Partners, as well as in corporations like Google to set and deliver their communications, PR and marketing strategy across Europe and beyond. Clara, absolutely awesome to have you in the studio with me. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for inviting me this morning. Um, yeah, I'm really excited because I think uh, at the moment there are uh, lots of uh, issues around PR in this current market, like th there's so many strategies that I think that both startups and VCs can implement. So I, I think it's going to be really interesting to get uh, your view on all of that stuff. But to start with, just so our audience can get a bit of an idea about you, uh, can you tell us about your first job? Sure. Yeah. So my first job out of university um, was actually in a PR agency in Paris. It was a British PR agency called Financial Dynamics. It was bought by FTI Consultancy Today. But at the time, I joined that fresh out of, um, of university where I'd been studying politics, international relations, um, languages, and so forth. And the reality is that I'd always been interested in the influence that the news has mm on how things are told, how stories are told. Uh, when you're studying politics, you can see that uh, there's clear editorial angles depending uh, not even just on the newspaper, but literally on the country yeah. and their stance. Yeah. So that's what kind of got me interested into PR in the first place. And uh, when I graduated uh, with a master's, I decided to go into where uh, PR is shaped. Okay, amazing. I mean, let's not get into the politics because if I start talking about Brexit, then we'll be here for another two hours. Uh, but what did you do uh, directly before you got into kind of the tech and venture ecosystem? So um, basically, my second job out of university was at Google. So, oh, wow. while so I was, straight in. <laughs> yeah, while I was working in Paris, um, just through my network and, and, and really actually trying to build my network as a young professional, uh, I met uh, this lovely American girl who happened to be a recruiter at Google. Mm. And we were at dinner in an Italian restaurant with a bunch of friends and I was kind of like doing my trilingual thing, like speaking French, speaking English, speaking Italian to the waiters. And she's yeah. like, wait a minute, like, you're very multilingual here. And, you know, they were building up the EMEA team at Google. Yeah, because so, this would have been early days, right? Yeah, it was 2007. Wow, okay, right. Well, it was 2006 been. and sort of, you know, nine interviews later and sort of five or six months later, I landed this job doing product PR at Google and I had to move from Paris to London, which was a big goodbye for me and, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and a big imagine. new chapter in my life, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and London obviously, uh, I think, just has a different vibe to it, right? Like generally, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was very exciting. Uh, you know, 2007 in London, like my roommates and most of my friends, you know, from university were like into investment banking. I was this weird, like on the side techie in Google's office, which was still relatively small. I think there were less than 500 people when I joined the Google London office. And today it's like maybe 3,000, I yeah, don't know. Yeah. Um, and the PR team in Europe was, I think, 19 people when I joined. Wow. Uh, and I'd hate to think how many that is. Yeah, today, it was like, 120 by the time I left in 2011, wow. just for Europe. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, and, and given kind of Europe's stance on regulation uh, and Google's kind of attitude towards the kind of do no harm and all of those sort of like, what is it? Don't be... Uh, do no evil. Do don't, no evil. Yeah. yeah, don't be evil or whatever don't it was, evil, right? Yeah. Like, the, the, I mean, again, like very, very strong sort of 
public statements and then it's it's really interesting to see how how businesses like that then actually transform that into action well actually on that point it was a really interesting time to be at google because i saw the tides turning literally internally mm. um because between 2007 and 2011 uh the share of revenue flipped between being US driven to being European driven. So while we were on the front foot of like, guys, we've got copyright issues and lawsuits out here and people care about privacy and we're, you know, mm. we have hearings at the European Commission and the US didn't care, HQs didn't care up until we were the number one revenue driver. And all of a sudden we got an armada of policy people and we st staffed up the the PR team in order to actually fight that battle. And not, I, I mean, I assume not only PR, but legal as well. I mean, like, yeah, it, for it's, sure. and it's interesting because of course we're going through kind of similar things i guess with open ai at the moment in, yeah. in europe and the uk um and and i'm sure that a lot of these things kind of history repeats itself but uh yeah i mean that must have been an incredible kind of time to be there and and, and doing what you do yeah um and so then what kind of triggered your move into founding third eye media having been at google excel various other places um so basically i mean if you fast forward after google i joined excel and you know that was kind of exciting because i was basically uh pring some of europe's very first funding announcements Amazing. 2011 2012 um, you know, some U.S. dollars being poured into European tech founders. It was very exciting. And um, reporters were just as excited as I was. Like, I built a super solid Rolodex of reporters. I mean, I was speaking to the Wall Street Journal and, like, WhatsApping these guys. You know, I was on very close contact with these people. After that, I moved to IZettle. And with mm -hmm. IZettle, uh, which is a Finnish or was at the time because they were bought by PayPal now, but we're a Finnish uh, fintech startup, I helped them break into Latin America. So we launched Mexico and Brazil. And after that, I came back and I was in this Panamia product role for iZettle. Yeah. And I didn't feel like I was growing. I was like, wait a minute, I've, I've been there and done that with Google already. Yeah. And then I left that. So I could feel this kind of glass ceiling energy falling upon me. <laughs> and I realized that I didn't just want a new job, like doing the same thing yeah. and then having that same vibe again. I needed a real structural change. Yeah. I had been to uh, Portugal twice for Google because Spain had you know, sued Google and we were knee deep in lawsuits with uh, Google search. They mm. decided that web search was infringing copyright. I mean, God, God knows why. And so they basically uh, clued in Portugal on what pieces of law they were using to sue Google and saying, why don't you try and do the same thing? So I had to go with some product managers down to Portugal um, for Google Books and Google News to go do some outreach with some of these publisher associations. Mm, mm. So I knew Lisbon mm. and I knew how lovely it was and I'd been going down there sort of for long weekends and things like that. And when I hit this moment of like, I don't feel I'm growing here and it's going to be a repeat, I just kind of pulled the plug on London, pulled the plug on the corporate life and went down to Lisbon. And what, what year was this in? This was late 2014. So you were kind of a trendsetter, right? Because there's quite, quite a few so people who have, have, have headed out there since then. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And from absolutely. the VC and, and tech ecosystem. Yeah, 100%. Right? So when I left, first of all, I really left through the back door. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't tell many people. And this is kind of what, what uh, created a, a pipeline of business and opportunities for me. People didn't know I'd left London. And so former Googlers would, you know, ping me and be like, hey, Clara, like, I've Zooglers, left Google. As yes, they, exactly. <laughs> as they call themselves, yeah. They'd tell me, you know, I've started a startup and and can you proofread my press release? Or, you know, we're scaling into France. Who should I speak to at Le Figaro um, if I wanted to embargo this news or whatever? And so after a while, I was like, wait a minute, I'm getting a lot of these, like, can you help me sort me out with a press list or whatever? Next one who comes through, I'm going to send them a scope and a fee. Yep. And so three, um, three of those in a row I acquired. Um, and so by the summer of 2015, I had my hands full mm -hmm. with a German startup and two British startups. And I was working by myself and kind of, you know, getting everything done, rolling up my sleeves, et cetera. And in uh, January of 2016, I converted that into a business and then staffed up the team. Amazing. I mean, yeah, we could talk about bootstrapping an agency again forever. <laughs> That's uh, dear to my heart. Um, but actually also interestingly for, 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 for the listeners, if you, if you don't want to get a little bit of additional background on Izettle, uh, check out the podcast I did with Josh Bell. Uh, from Dawn Capital, uh, who were one of the the, the principal kind of um, uh, VCs that funded Izettle and, and saw them through to the exit to PayPal, but it's it's actually a really incredible uh, story, and and you know I think it's one of those. Uh, very, very intrinsically European success stories that is never talked about, un you know, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and and so, what do you think you would would be doing if you weren't 
uh, heading up Third Eye Media or weren't kind of in the tech and venture ecosystem? What do you What do you think you would have? Where do you think you would have landed in I another mean, life? Who knows? I mean, if I hadn't uh, made the jump to leave London, I would probably be, you know, in a in a big senior role in PR. Mm. Uh, if I'd taken a more creative route, you know, I mean, you, you know, and we've talked about this offline, how much I love yoga. I also dance. So who knows? Maybe I'd be a ballerina or something completely different. That would be uh, awesome. I really, really need movement in my life. So it's, you know, I'm very close to my practice. That is that is definitely a, another podcast to be done. But let's talk about Third Eye Media for a second. Um, so can you tell us a little bit? you know who it's for who are your kind of clients uh what do you do and and what do you do better than others i guess got it yeah yeah, yeah. so we work um you know in the tech industry but we really tell stories of innovation and entrepreneurship so mostly we're working with startups scale-ups and vcs and you know we're multilingual and multi-market so i think mm. what we do best is that we're able to scale in a very agile way from the get-go. So if you're an early stage startup in France, for example, and you raise 15 million uh, from a UK and a French VC, but you're gonna use that cash to launch, for example, in Spain and Portugal, we can literally produce that PR announcement in four languages simultaneously for you because we speak those languages in-house or we've got, um, you know, partners uh, that can execute the strategy for us. Yeah, amazing. So, so essentially, if you are, <clears throat> uh, a startup that is operating out of multiple uh, countries within Europe, you, you which are... by definition you are, because yeah. as a fast growing to. startup or scale up here, yeah. or even as a VC, you're always addressing the region. And so we try to bridge the gap in that linguistic and cultural fragmentation, um, you know, to kind of just try and disseminate the news and, and, and help feed and generate that growth. And have you been able to maintain your kind of Rolodex black book, a little black book of kind of media contacts? Is like, how has that evolved? Because, I mean, this is a completely separate strand. We probably should take this up in the main podcast. But, um, you know, with the proliferation of social media, where social media seems to be where everyone gets their news, where, you know, you're seeing uh, traditional, certainly print media kind of uh, uh, starting to, uh, to become much smaller in terms of reach. Uh, online media, obviously, there's just so much of it out there. Like, how do you think about that, I guess? Because, you know, surely that's got to be a bit of a challenge in this in, in this environment as well. Yes and no. I think um, the role of a PR has evolved a lot. But at the same time, you know, nothing will ever beat the fact that getting proper editorial coverage is third party advocacy. Yeah. You know, there's a process of very rigorous selection that happens in a newsroom to deem you newsworthy or not, mm. right? And so the difference between you going on your channels and saying, look, this is us, this is what we do, we're and great, and we're different saying, because, yeah. exactly, and a reporter at The Guardian or even something much smaller, you know, even a, a smaller tech blog saying yeah. that, that, you know, it signals authoritativeness and it generates discoverability in a different way. Yeah. I mean, and again, maybe we'll touch it. We'll, we'll touch on this on the main in the main podcast. But I think, you know, that difference also between paid and earned. Right. hundred percent. Well. Like that, that I think is super critical. Yeah. Um, so just to wrap up the, the, the primer, um, can you talk about three trends that you are excited about within the media landscape or even within the kind of tech ecosystem, given how much we've we've, we've sort of seen a shift over the last 12, 24 months? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the first one, um, it, it goes beyond the last 12 months, I would say. But I feel like Europe is getting better and better at understanding PR. Like as a French American person also who built their career mostly out of the UK. I spent eight years in the UK before mm -hmm. moving down to Portugal. I see the difference between the Anglo-Saxon perspective and value that's given to the media and the continent. And I feel like that gap's being bridged. J just to interrupt you for a second, yes. actually, that, that, that's super interesting to me. We talked about this earlier uh, offline as well. But f like, I think in, in the UK, certainly, I think there's almost like some cringiness. Like there's, there's like, if I saw tons of press about myself or something, I think there's, you know, there, there's a, there's a, almost a visceral response by by people saying, oh, you know, who's that guy trying to trying to put themselves up on a pedestal and, and, and be, you know, kind of out there. Um, and I, I think we tend to only value that where it is like a very big brand name or, you know, individual that, that I, I guess that a lot of people know about. But if you are just sort of a Joe Schmo, kind of having your name in the press almost feels like, a, a negative indicator to, 
to some extent. And maybe that's just my Anglo-Saxon kind of reserve. I don't know. No, I mean, I guess, you know, they're slightly uh, different topics in the sense that what we were discussing earlier is more like, can there be such a thing as tooting your horn too much and yeah. doing too much PR? What I'm discussing more is like, you know, five, 10 years ago, I'd still get a founder saying, hey, Clara, can you help us with our funding announcement? We just posted it on LinkedIn, but now we want TechCrunch. Do you know what I mean? Like people just not understanding the exclusivity yeah. around news. Do you see what I mean? Things like that, Got that it. now are getting better and better and it makes our job better and better. People are starting to understand when are we ripe for PR? Mm. Uh, what makes a, a news story? We also had tons of people coming and saying, we've just overhauled our logo. Can mm. we get coverage? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so those things are happening less and less. And, and this is a great sign. It means people are starting to understand how to integrate PR early stages mm. into their strategy for growth. Yeah. And that's, that's fun. Second trend um, that I think I would love to talk about is how this is a little bit not so much core to me, but nice to see how social media is actually forcing brands towards accountability and towards becoming more humane. You know, and we all have examples coming up to our head. I don't I don't want to like promote anyone. Well, but Ben and Jerry's is probably the, the most kind of, you know, famous, one, fabulous. Right. right? Yeah. And I think this is great. I think this is really important because I think things are no longer siloed and social media can be used as a two way channel. When I started, um, you know, working in this industry, we were talking and very excited about user generated content. Mm. But that wasn't creating so much of a conversation the way social channels are today. And I think that's great. And this is having a positive influence on how PR as a whole is playing out. The last one I want to talk about is actually kind of flipping things on their head. We talk a lot about the demise of uh, media outlets because there's so many other channels. Mm. But if we look at the last five years with also the emergence of fake news and us all sitting at home with COVID and consuming that fake news, we're seeing that the reality is that we're very happy to see the editorial rigor of a New York Times, of a Financial Times, of a Guardian, of the Times of London, Le Figaro, Le Monde, we know what we're getting. Mm. And there's rigor and there's a methodology, um, you know, and, and professionals in the newsroom. And that can't be replaced. And, and, and I mean, I, I listen to a ton of podcasts where, where there are predominantly journalists on those podcasts. And, and the reason I listen to them is because I do know that they will have done a level of research. It's not yeah. opinion, right? There is opinion, clearly, right? Right. But that there is that level of uh, scrutiny around what they are what they are discussing yeah. as opposed to uh, exactly as you say right like you see i don't know Elon Musk's repost something on Twitter and all of a sudden that becomes the news even though there's no verification it's not right. verifiable etc and obviously i think one of the things that they've done uh you know is this community notes kind of thing on Twitter where where there's a little bit of additional rigor i think where where, where social media uh, has absolutely let us down is allowing opinion to proliferate must as uh, as fact right and and that I think is partly kind of uh, the the problem that we're seeing and I, I I would fully agree like I mean I would say that whilst I read as widely as possible the one kind of uh, uh, journalistic source of news that I look to is the Financial Times. Like it, it, it is, for me, I know that what I'm getting there is exactly what they say. And again, yeah. there may be opinion. In fact, very often they will be upfront about the fact that it's opinion and not news right. um, or reporting as such. Uh, but I think what I think is also interesting within that whole sphere is, but there is a whole cohort of people that have completely shunned that tradition, you know, the mainstream media kind of thing, uh -huh. uh, and are looking to these sort of slightly more sketchy sources of news and information. So I guess like one one question to kind of counteract your point there is, how does one battle that, right? Because there is, you know, there are people out there that will just believe whatever they see on social media rather than necessarily going back to the source. Yeah, and I think again, it's the difference between uh, the methodology, the rigor and the fact checking that, that happens in a, in a sort of professional newsroom yeah. and these kind of opinion orientated, you know, outrageous generating headlines, yeah. right? But um, obviously I don't have an answer for that. Sure. It's a big, um, you know, it's a big topic. One thing's for sure is that um, we're realizing that some of these super platforms, social media super platforms are kind of feeding that beast. Mm. And that's being questioned and well, battled. Yeah. And and we're seeing at the moment a lot of that uh, with regards to TikTok. Obviously, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, has, right. has always been at the center of that and Facebook as well, right? But um, Clara, it's been absolutely awesome uh, talking to you uh, this morning. Uh, I can't wait to get into the main episode. I think there's a lot of stuff we're going to be able to talk about. Uh, but for the meantime, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you.